Alistair Thompson from the Scoop here with Hamish Bohannon, who is the Managing Director, CEO of Bathurst Resources. And um, we've been working on a feature series of feature articles about um, the escarpment mine in the town of Westport. And, and, um, and we, we spoke on the, on the 21st of June, and, and now I've got some additional questions here to ask you. So essentially, I think I'd like to start by the, with a description of, of your your arrival in Westport and, and what you found there and why you are interested so much in Westport as a, as a destination for a mining. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. I was there. It's, uh, I, I guess my first visit to Westport was uh, uh, back in 2009 with Jeff Loudon from L&M, uh, who we, we subsequently purchased the L&M uh, coal off Jeff and that became Buller. Um, arrived in Westport and uh, immediately recognised the strong uh, connections with the mining industry, the street names, uh, the, the, the uh, mining equipment through the town, the strong mining museum, uh, and went up onto the plateau with Jeff and we could see uh, all the mining history around us, it's steeped in history, uh, and went to uh, the escarpment block which L&M had identified as, as uh, the best place to start the mining project. Uh, and what you, you're first hit by uh, is uh, some of the old workings there um, with acid drainage coming out of the workings. So uh, one of the first things I, I recognised was there's an opportunity to actually address that by mining them out, closing it over. That acid drainage uh, would go away quite easily. Um, interestingly enough, it wasn't long after when I said that would be one of our goals um, that uh, Royal Forest and Bird actually announced that they weren't interested in acid drainage. That wasn't the key element. Uh, and it became uh, quite obvious quite quickly that there was a whole uh, suite of complexities and issues on the plateau. Uh, whilst there was 130 years of, of mining history, whilst there were uh, two operating mines, uh, one uh, large one uh, above us at Stockton, uh, and at that time Easton's Cascade mine adjacent to us, um, there were a whole suite of issues. So it's been quite a journey since those initial, well, this is a great mining community, it's more than just a mining community. There are other issues as well, but the mining is what underpins it. One of one of the aspects there is the geography of it, of its being so close to both railway lines and a port as well. That makes it more economically viable. Absolutely, I, I can remember uh, standing with Jeff uh, up at Mount Rochford, which is beyond where we want to mine. And you can quite clearly see the town below you. Uh, you can see the railway line below you. Uh, and uh, Jeff and I discussed it, and I said, you know, this is fantastic. Uh, You've got a, a mining history, you've got a mining community, but more importantly, there is infrastructure in place ready to go. This is an incredible asset for New Zealand. Let's bring it into production, let's get it developed. And the other aspect, obviously, is the special quality of the coal. The coal, when, uh, when Jeff first sent me the uh, uh, details on the coal, uh, I uh, quickly responded to him saying, I think there's been a few uh, typos in the documents, this, this coal. Uh, is almost too good to believe, uh, elements like the fluidity, which is one of the, the characteristics that makes it unique, um, was just a, a very large figure, it was over 10,000 units. Typically uh, good coal uh, is 1 to 2,000 and average coal is 400, the DDPM is the unit. Um, and uh, he then sent me a PDF with uh, hundreds of drill holes on it and you could see that the fluidities in fact were often higher than that. This really is a, a very special coal. If you were to take a, a bag of this coal to Japan, to one of the uh, big steel mills there, within hours they tell you exactly where it's come from. They'd say this is from the west coast of New Zealand. It's, it is that special. So, since we last talked, um, well actually, no, let's, let's talk a little bit about escarpment as well. So, I, I visited escarpment with you, and um, it's, a, it's a relatively small area, 106 hectares, and sort of, I don't know, it's gently sloped. Um, to the north and has interesting vegetation on it. Um, what that particular deposit is the deposit that you, that you intend to start mining. Can you talk about that in the context of, of, your, of the wider intentions for, for both the Deniston and perhaps for the Buller? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And I think one of the um, challenges that we've had and it was addressed back in uh, 2011 during the original uh, Commission hearings is that this has always been the first step in establishing a new independent New Zealand coal miner and there are um, 
eight or nine different areas in that uh, Buller horizon that have got coal uh, that would be amenable to extraction. Uh, the coal varies across the plateau from being absolutely fantastic to being fantastic. It's, it, the coal does have a variability. So the plan has always been to start at escarpment for the environmental reasons originally um, and uh, then to bring in other areas around. Um, that of course raised immediate issues that here was this uh, uh, big Australian coal miner uh, which of course we're not, we've never actually mined coal in Australia, that's just where, where the, the company was, was born, um, was going to destroy the whole plateau. Uh, so we committed to the Commission back then to come forward with a plan defining where we were going to mine, more important, where we weren't going to mine. So we've spent many millions of dollars uh, drilling across the plateau to identify really where the coal is. It isn't everywhere. Um, you can't choose where it is, it is where it is. Uh, and we've been working with the various stakeholders to identify what areas on the plateau will be mined. And interestingly enough, um, the, the area that will ultimately potentially be mined, you know, provided we meet all the different uh, requirements and licenses and permits and everything else, is about 20, 25% at the most of the plateau. So the 75% will never be mined. Um, that, that, that is just uh, a fact, so you know, we're, we're trying to work out ways of ensuring that those other areas will be protected for perpetuity uh, and part of this, this initial block, uh, what uh, we have in this day and age of acronyms uh, called the DPPA, um, that's the, one of these first preserved areas that will never be mined, so the, uh, the uh, very special uh, ecologies there can be preserved, can be monitored. Uh, and also used as a benchmark against which we can rehabilitate. Um, this particular the escarpment block has an estimated reserves of 7 million tonnes of, the, oh yes. of that order and depending on the value that could be worth somewhere between 1 and maybe 1.5 and billion dollars. Probably in today's, uh, uh, with the lower prices today, yeah, let's assume they never, require, never recover, which of course won't be the case, coal prices do go up and down, mm -hmm. or down and up, uh, so somewhere about a billion dollars. Yeah. Is it viable at low pro the prices of where they are now? Well, this, this is the uh, creme de la creme in, in, in coal. Mm. Um, so, uh, yes, coal prices have come off, but even at the uh, 140 possibly even $135, it's viable. Uh, we believe uh, even with uh, all the uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, commitments that we've made, um, the 22 million that, that we've uh, uh, agreed that will be paid, um, our net cost will be about $115 a ton. So there's still a good 20 to $30 margin if coal prices go back to where they were, which was mid 200s or higher, so there's a substantial margin. And we're talking 225 mining jobs, roughly. Initially, for, for the escarpment, it's about 225. Uh, uh, we've got about 50 up there at the moment, mm -hmm. or in Westport at the moment. Um, so it's a rapid build up. Um, it's jobs for Kiwis. This isn't uh, underground mining. This is uh, uh, open cast mining, uh, so it's uh, uh, good uh, skills that uh, w we can get locally. And there would locally be there'd likely be additional contractor jobs as well. That includes. I, there's no difference between a contractor and, and a staff. Uh, you know, well, additional, the, additional support. There'll be a lot of additional support. To that is people directly involved with the mining process. Mm -hmm. It doesn't include uh, the the uh, extra. Uh, activities uh, in the community, uh, the cafes, the, the shipping, the road transport and everything else, there's, there's a big multiplier effect. Since we last talked in Westport on June 21st, quite a lot's happened. We've had several court cases, several more judgments have come through, um, some positive, some less so, and we've had indications from, from Forest and Bird that they're going to appeal some of those judgments. The latest one, which was yesterday, seemed to be very positive. It's been reported as giving you a provisional green light to go ahead essentially. Um, and it's come back to you with to basically seeking some more information or some, some final clarity essentially around um, offsets on the one hand and remediation work on the other hand. Is that is that essentially No, that was the previous uh, and really this uh, the crux that the uh, court has come back to is certainty and clarity about the DPPA. That's the, That's the reserve. The so uh, the fact, the sad reality is that um, back in the uh, mid 80s, um, there were areas uh, identified along the west coast, which were recognised as areas that the Department of Conservation should put up for protection. Mm. Uh, they were given the acronym, as we do an acronym, of, of RAP, 
recommended areas for protection. Mm -hmm. So these lines were uh, penciled in on the maps or dotted lines around them on the maps and the, there is one on the Deniston Plateau. Uh, in the 90s, the uh, uh, environmental experts uh, came out with the reports to support those areas and here we are in 2013 and they are still dots on the map, nothing's happened. Um, so what we don't want to do is have a company, in our case Bathurst, say this is what we're going to do and then be sitting here in 2020 or worse and it hasn't happened. So it's all about giving certainty uh, to making this happen. One of the other um, things that Forest and Birds responded to this latest judgment has been to say, well, there's still issues around transportation in terms of, in, in terms of transporting on coal on the road. You're intending to build an aerial conveyor, I understand that, and transportation on the road is go, would take place for what period of time do you until that uh, conveyor is built and it's got all its licensing to go through. So all the engineering uh, is completed. Uh, there's 13 towers that go down off the plateau. Mm -hmm. um, there's environmental work, uh, uh, fauna and flora surveys are, uh, uh, are in the process if they haven't already just been completed. And then the application for that starts. So we believe that the earliest that that will be is about two years away. Right. So up till that time we'll be trucking off the plateau. Um, of course, you know, notwithstanding the rhetoric, we don't need extra trucking permits to truck on the, uh, the, the council uh, uh, and, and main roads. Um, we do need our concession uh, for trucking on the bit on the top and interestingly, uh, you know, part of our concession application, the block that's been blocked out has a bit of main road on it, but that's trivial. We don't actually need a license to drive right. on that main road. We've got it and are already, you know, we're trucking off the plateau today. At the moment. Uh, with our cascade production. So they, so Forest and Bird think there'll be a great deal more road traffic with a scarf and underwear? They will. Uh, you know, we've been working with the community. We've uh, had a, a suite of meetings uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Waimangaroa. Um, and those meetings have gone exceptionally well. I think uh, just from the, 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 the photographs uh, that uh, I've been receiving for the last 48 hours on the West Coast, um, it's almost carnival time. Uh, it's been very tough on the West Coast really since uh, uh, the timber industry was closed, but in recent years uh, uh, we've had um, uh, obviously the tragedy at, at Pike River uh, that was then uh, followed with Spring Creek closure and, and solid energy going through uh, this difficult period uh, and further job losses there. Uh, and then uh, only uh, uh, this last week uh, we've had Holsim confirm that they've got two to three years to go uh, and now uh, we've had this uh, recent appeal by Forest and Bird. So the support we have on the, from the community has really blown up in the last 48 hours and, and it's quite visible. So yes, there's some increased trucking for a finite period, but the support we've had from the community uh, and the liaison that we've done with them, we're not trucking through school uh, shift change or, or class change time, uh, we're not trucking through night, uh, all of that we can do and we're working with the community to do that. No one wants extra trucks, it's about four an hour. Uh, no one wants extra trucks, but for the overall picture, they don't want the jobs, they don't want the income into the community. So there's that balance, so there's strong support. And they just have to be careful. And, and we have to be careful. Um, I can tell you from, from a personal viewpoint, I will be really happy when the Conveyors Commission and the trucking stops, you know. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our schools uh, are great and the children are looked after very responsibly. I think more of a worry for me is, is the tourist uh, that's not used to driving in wet, windy conditions, uh, coming around the corner on the wrong side of the road or whatever. That's, that's more of my worries and I'll be happy when that's all gone. We're obviously spending a lot of money on upgrading the road, uh, putting in... Uh, uh, the main road. The main road, mm -hmm. uh, with the council, yeah. uh, putting in provisions to make it safer. Um, but at the end of the day, it'd be nice to take the trucks away and put it on the conveyor. Um, you mentioned the port operation decision, which obviously is quite a big blow for the town. Um, and that also has some significant implications beyond just the loss of jobs for the operations of the port itself. Yeah. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, West, Westport is a, is a river port, obviously the Buller River goes through Westport. Um, but the West Coast uh, is, uh, uh, has a huge amount of glacial traffic on it. All the, the detritus from uh, our beautiful glaciers and fjordland is washed up the west coast. So Greymouth, Westport have a, a stream of uh, sand and rock and boulders that continually piles up at the front of the river. Um, Westport has a dredge that operates uh, continuously year round. 
uh, and at the moment it is pretty well wholly funded by Holcim. Uh, at the moment you stop dredging, then the mouth of the river silts up and you basically get in and out with uh, small, very small fishing boats and not much else. So without that ongoing dredging, the other activities, the tuna boats that come through a couple of times a year, and the other activities stop as well. So it's really important to keep uh, the port active. So us coming into the port will, will allow that to happen. You build a big shed on the port, and I mean, I, I, my understanding is that that's partly a, um, about negotiations or improving the negotiation position in relation to the railway, the trans Railway as well. Oh, partly, not really. I think the, the key thing, and, and we've been reminded again, um, is that the tunnel through to Littleton goes through the Alps. And it might not survive. And, you know, if we do have a, a, an Alpine fault movement, um, you know, invariably we will one day, but hopefully it's way out in the future and, and it's not significant. But that's a risk we have to manage. So having two routes to, to market, as it's called, is very important. Um, we believe there's, there's the balance. So we have committed from day one to take part of our coal, and we have an agreement with, with Solid Energy to ship some of our coal out through Hilton and the rest out through Westport. It is a balance, and it's important for both companies. You know, it would be disastrous for Solid Energy um, if there was a, a, a major Alpine fault movement and that tunnel was down. So the, we've now got a modern best practice shed there that is available to load coal into a vessel without putting dust everywhere. Um, you, you've talked a lot about the long-term sustainable plans for the coast and for the Buller region. Your detractors might criticise you and say that, that all this talk of building sustainable futures is just a way of getting people on your side so that you can build a coal mine and make a bunch of profit and do what yeah. I mean, the traditional approach to mining. How, how, can you, how do you respond to that cynicism? If you like? I, I think the uh, interesting thing is that the, the mining industry is often regarded as one of the oldest industries. Uh, uh, we have our own saint, St. Barbara, and, and mining has been recognised uh, in some of the oldest printing documents and mining ruins, Zimbabwe ruins, for example, in Zimbabwe. Um, it's been around a long time. The reality is 99% of, of mineral deposits are finite, measurably finite. There are very few huge ones like Norilsk in Russia or Olympic Dam in Australia. So the industry has been built around finite resources. It's the industry. Uh, that provides the uh, values and the materials to give us all a better quality of life. Um, so it's using those finite resources to maintain a sustainable industry, to provide that ongoing employment. It's ensuring that the value goes back. It doesn't only go back, profit's the end of the line. You know, we won't make profit for quite a while, um, but in the meanwhile, we're still employing people. That puts revenue back into the community. We're uh, paying taxes and royalties. That puts uh, money back into treasury. Um, we're uh, putting infrastructure in which will generate other income for the community. We're working very closely with Swires uh, on a purpose-built vessel that will allow coal to go out and containers to go in and out. So it's a, a purpose-built vessel. That will have spin-offs for the community. Um, it's, it's the bigger picture. It's not just about the reserve. The reserve is finite. I think, uh, I think the question is, is why? Why do you, as, a, as an individual, want to adopt a town and preserve its future. I, 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 future. I'm not uh, adopting a town. Um, we are equally uh, a uh, community member in Southlands, mm. uh, in Timaru, in Canterbury. Um, it's about, I believe, uh, license to operate. I think the old days of the, of the big, rich, fat general managers, doesn't matter what the industry was, um, are gone. It's all about being responsible, 